Mike Diedrich, and I would like you to welcome you to a panel discussion and public comments on the Burns Novick Vietnam series. The date is October 7th, 2017. This event is sponsored by Veterans for Peace and the Southeast Asia Center of the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies, University of Washington. The program will consist of four short presentations by the panel members followed by public comments and questions. Please hold your, co your questions until the panel presentations are done. Everyone who wishes to speak will have an opportunity to do so. We realize that the second, quote, second Indochina War, as it call is called by most Western historians, is a controversial period in U.S. Vietnamese history and ask that audience remarks be respectful and civil in tone. Panelists will be introduced with the short biographies and talking points followed by their presentations. Christoph Giebel holds a joint appointment with the History Department and the Jackson School of International Studies at the University of Washington. His research and teaching interests concern 20th century Vietnam, comparative colonialism and empire in Southeast Asia. He earned his PhD at Cornell University in 1996 and has imagined authors and has authored Imagined Ancestries of Vietnamese Communism Tan Duc Tang and the Politics of History and Memory. A former conscientious objector in Western Germany, Christoph served as a German Red Cross medic in the Vietnamese refugee crisis in the South China Sea in 1980 and 81. Thereafter, he studied at Germany, Vietnam, and Taiwan before coming to the U.S. He has taught university courses on Vietnam and the war in Vietnam for more than 20 years. As well, he has led 12 U.S. University of Washington overseas study programs in Vietnam and focused on the legacy of the war in contemporary central Vietnam. His comments will focus mainly on the series framing of the topic, particularly colonialism and communism, the use of one-sided terminology, and the insufficient explanation of the 1954 Geneva Accords, an appreciation of which is necessary to fully understand the 1973 Paris Agreement. Professor Giebel. I'll do that in order. I'll do them in order of the uh, presentations. Okay. Good. So um, while you're still wondering who the others are on the panel, I'm supposed to give my presentation. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, and uh, Mike, thanks for the introduction. My voice usually carries well, but uh, if not, please let me know. Um, so I welcome this opportunity to comment on the Ken Burns uh, Linovic series. Uh, this was uh, uh, a long time in the coming. Uh, for 10 years, uh, many of us in the field were aware that this series was, uh, was being made. And uh, some of my colleagues, in fact, were on the um, expert uh, team uh, that uh, Novick and Burns assembled. And so um, there was quite an excitement building um, as, it become, as, as it came closer to um, the showing in, in this September. And I want to, uh, before I start my critical comments, I want to um, uh, first say that I uh, do very much admire uh, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick's uh, work overall. Um, uh, it's a very, very fine craftsmanship um, that they have been employing. Uh, they have included a lot of material, some of that actually new. Um, and uh, I do also want to acknowledge that, this, uh, that, that uh, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick uh, do have artistic freedom. Uh, in, in the way in which they want to uh, frame their documentary. Um, and they have obviously uh, taken a kind of a prescriptive uh, 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 take uh, on presenting history. They want to focus on uh, healing. Uh, and they are focused uh, particularly on the uh, United States side of, of things. And uh, keep in mind that I, uh, in my academic work, I uh, work on uh, particularly on Vietnamese perspectives of, of the war. Um, so uh, I do not want to engage in kind of nitpicking or, uh, or as um, you know, some people uh, would say bean counting, you know, but this side had three people talking and the other side had seven people talking or anything like this. Uh, I think this is, uh, this is really not uh, particularly um, worthwhile uh, to get into. 
Um, but uh, I want to focus on uh, the kind of uh, it, the ways in which this series was marketed, very heavily promoted uh, for uh, quite a long time as presenting a new perspective and, uh, and a new take uh, on the uh, war in Vietnam and also the celebrated inclusion of uh, Vietnamese uh, voices that the series claimed had not been done um, before. And I also want to talk a little bit about how, uh, whether or not uh, some core facts were, uh, uh, that Ken Burns or Lynn Owick got, got core facts uh, right. And here, um, when uh, KCTS 9, the local, our local PBS station, promoted uh, the series already in July and August, uh, they themselves in their promotional materials got uh, uh, some core uh, events wrong. And uh, when I approached them to try to correct these, um, these historical inaccuracies, um, they did not uh, want to entertain any changes uh, to that. So factuality will also be um, part of my comments. So as Mike said, my expertise is more on Vietnamese experiences, on Vietnamese history, um, the um, various sides uh, involved in the conflict. Um, I'm particularly interested in colonialism and neocolonialism in Southeast Asia and um, work on uh, rhetorical framing and spatial representation um, of the conflict. Uh, and spatial representation will become clear um, uh, during my remarks what I mean by that. Um, so as such, as somebody who is interested in how larger narratives are framed, the deeper framing, so to say, I was particularly interested in episodes number one, the beginning, and episodes nine and ten, the ending. Right? Uh, so the introduction and conclusion, so to say, as uh, ways in which uh, Novik and Burns contextualized uh, the conflict, set it up, and framed it. And uh, I want to make uh, six points that are kind of interrelated uh, to that. Um, and in roughly chronological order, uh, the first point starts with uh, a, what I would say is a very ill-explained colonial context. Um, so episode one uh, very hastily rushes through um, 80 years of uh, French colonial uh, occupation of Vietnam and arrives in 1961 after 75 minutes. Um, there is, of course, in the series a lot of concern about communism, um, but there is never a mention of what this colonial system entailed, that this was a, a part of a, a global uh, Western uh, campaign of unprovoked war making to establish a, a capitalist system of exploitation of uh, non-white peoples. Uh, there is no mention at all of uh, 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 white supremacy, that we were living in a world of white supremacy which is given completely accepted by Westerners, that uh, we are operating in a world of racial hierarchies, whites on top, non-whites below. Right? Uh, and if you don't uh, contextualize that, I think the, the whole racist or racial aspects of the conflict uh, cannot be understood. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, you know, that there was overt racism, but it is embedded in the whole context in, uh, in which various uh, players are operating. Um, in part here also I want to emphasize it, uh, leaving aside the capitalist and white supremacist side of the colonial system fails to really understand at a deeper level what motivated a lot of Vietnamese, right? That they were fighting not just for their independence in their country, but for their very uh, for the very core of their human dignity that was denied uh, them uh, over uh, many decades. Um, my second point and uh, connected to my first one is that if you don't explain enough uh, the system of capitalist colonial exploit exploitation uh, under institutions of white supremacy, you also uh, do not understand uh, the United States' role in this world. Uh, the United States uh, uh, <coughs> appears in this series in 1945. The first American actor is coming in 1945, and he plays a role of a kind of a neutral mediator between the returning French colonialists and the Viet Minh. 
And that completely elides that the United States was part, was part and parcel of that colonial system, of a worldwide system of racialized exploitation. Um, the United States is portrayed as somebody who is not involved in the colonial system, that the United States is in fact an anti-colonial force. Well, the United States is ruling the Philippines as a colony. It attacked the first constitutional republic of Asia, the Republic of the Philippines, unprovoked in 1899 and conquered it in years of bloody warfare that foreshadowed, in fact, many of the American military tactics um, in Vietnam. So Burns and Novick fall back in a very convenient, ahistorical and exceptionalist portrayal of the United States. And that is only possible because colonialism as such and a system of white supremacy is elided. So the United States comes out, so to say, as an rather innocent and neutral and well-meaning, but maybe a little bit bumbling actor in 1945. My third point, um, and I I'm, I'm, I'm leave my comments, I hope at least, rather short. Um, historians are rather verbose, so excuse me. But my third point related to the um, two preceding ones is that uh, without any mention of capitalism, and its role in a system of global colonial exploitation. Uh, likewise, we have this notion of communism that is never explained. And so here we have the Vietnamese communists, and they are the enemy, and they are rather ruthless, and, um, and all that. Uh, but what made these people communists is never really fully explored. And it cannot be explored if you do not understand the system uh, out of which uh, communist and revolutionary and anti-colonial movements arose. Right. Um, so here we fall back in very tried and true Cold War tropes of communists on the one side and nationalists on the other. Nationalists are the kind of the good guys um, and the communists are in fact not even really Vietnamese. Right? Because there's a, there's a scene in which a a former general of the Saigon government is able to say into the camera that the uh, Viet Minh, the communists or communist-led revolutionaries uh, were just interested in setting up an internationalist communist regime. And that's a smear that is uh, uh, not uh, contextualized at all in this, uh, in this uh, uh, series. And needless to say, of course, communists were nationalists just as the others uh, other, uh, were as well. Uh, my fourth point is um, that I find that the series in its beginning overemphasizes the uh, civil war character of the conflict in the 1940s and into the 1950s. Now, let me say uh, a few things about that. Uh, I'm uh, uh, in my own teaching, in, uh, in my own work. Uh, I very readily uh, want to give voice to the various sides among Vietnamese. The uh, Vietnamese were very much divided uh, politically, socially, uh, regionally, uh, by religion and in other ways. So uh, there is, of course, a revolutionary narrative in Vietnam still going on that is very much homogenizing, glory to the communists and all that. Uh, Vietnamese society is complex, it is diverse, and there were deep divisions even in the fight against colonial oppression. Right? So there were uh, vast divisions in the um, Vietnamese visions uh, how to uh, structure and run a post-colonial nation. Uh, that said, I think in the 1940s, to talk about the divisions within Vietnamese society as a civil war is misusing that word. Um, when we talk about the Civil War in the United States, we talk about 1861 to 1865. There are organized armies, there are very clear uh, sides to it, uh, there are battles and all that. Uh, uh, we would not say a civil war raged in the United States when we think about uh, John Brown and the anti-abolitionist raids, for example. It starts in 1861 and ends in 1865. So civil war has a particular 
meaning that I think is stretched beyond um, uh, meaningful uh, ways in, uh, in the series uh, because it overemphasizes one side that for all intents and purposes was uh, forced to associate uh, with the French because of their anti-colonial leanings and the particularly uh, strong appeals of revolutionary nationalists on the other side. Um, in that regard also, when we talk about civil war, when Ken Burns and Lynn Novick talk about civil war, uh, they leave out uh, core information. And here again, this is not bean counting, but these are core information that anybody who wants to understand the Vietnam War needs to understand. And um, that is, for example, that the French divided Vietnam in three regions. The southernmost region was, in fact, uh, no longer run by what the series calls puppet emperors, the old Vietnamese puppet emperors. The, core, the, the, the deep south around Saigon in the Mekong Delta was completely run by the French, it was a colony of the French, and therefore from the 1860s on had a very different social and economic trajectory from the rest of the country. Now you have to understand this when you want to understand when, uh, uh, how uh, social forces that came out of Cochin China, the Deep South, became later on the elites of the Republic, the Saigon government, the Saigon regime that the United States uh, supported. There's no mention of Cochin China, ergo uh, uh, viewers cannot make that connection that there was a social strata in Vietnamese society in the Deep South that directly led to the divisions and the alignment with the United States in, in Saigon. There's no mention of two Vietnamese states, the Democratic Republic, uh, established in September 1945, and the French established Associated State of Vietnam in 1949. Now, we talk about division and, um, and partition of Vietnam as of 1954. The fact is that Vietnam was divided politically already by 1949, albeit not spatially. These were two Vietnamese states that claimed all Vietnamese authority. And they were, of course, mutually exclusive. If we do not understand this, we will fall back inevitably in the old Cold War tropes of North Vietnam versus South Vietnam. And that, of course, happens in the series precisely because Ken Burns and Lynn Novick failed to lay the foundation for a much more complex understanding of uh, how the war played out in, uh, in ideological, spatial, regional, and, um, and social uh, terms. Uh, my fifth point, there's six, so please bear with me. Okay. Uh, my, fifth, my fifth point, um, because of all these others, um, the Geneva Accords of 1954 are insufficiently portrayed. Here we see uh, Geneva uh, in 1954 uh, discussed in the uh, uh, you know, very standard mainstream Cold War uh, narratives. That it was at Geneva that Vietnam was divided and in fact it is portrayed now as two discrete countries. Well, the, the demilitarized zone that was established uh, with the Geneva Accords was not a political border. It was a temporary military and administrative uh, division setting up two zones. And those two zones uh, would be administered uh, by the contending states that the series has never introduced for two years and then overcome by reunification, by all Vietnamese reunification uh, elections. So the DMZ is not a political border. Let me underline this again. This is not a political border. Vietnam is not two countries. In fact, the two contending Vietnamese states, the Democratic Republic with a capital in Hanoi and the Republic of Vietnam in Saigon, claimed to have sole legitimate authority over all of the country. Right? So the Saigon government, the Republic of Vietnam, did not simply say, okay, our country is the whole South until the DMZ. No, that's not what they said. Right? They 
just like the Hanoi government, the communists, their enemies, agreed, in fact, that Vietnam was indivisible. It was never divided politically. So that false narrative of division into two discrete countries, not states, but two countries, was the propagandistic setup that the United States used throughout the Cold War to frame the conflict in their, um, in their fashion. Right? And that is one of the uh, uh, most consequential mistakes of the Ken burns Novick series because it creates shortcomings throughout the rest of the series. Um, and I'll give you an example. Uh, the, uh, the continuous uh, um, um, portrayal of organized revolutionary forces as the quote-unquote North Vietnamese army. Hmm? There was no North Vietnamese army. It was called the People's Army of Vietnam. It was the Army of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. It was established in September 1949 and that had absolutely no problem seeing themselves operating in the south of their own country. And when you talk about the People's Army as a North Vietnamese army, you imply very heavily that they are not legitimate south of the DMZ. And my final point here under this rubric is that if you do not understand Geneva, in 1954, you also will not understand the Paris Agreement of 1973 and why Kissinger accepted a ceasefire in place. Because that is portrayed as giving away, so to say, the war. The People's Army was, the North Vietnamese Army was allowed to stay in South Vietnam, quote unquote, um, and therefore uh, that is the big betrayal. And I'm happy to go into this a little bit more in, uh, in our discussion. Uh, my sixth point is, therefore, terminology matters. Right? Terminology matters. And here, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick uh, have continuously used Western uh, uh, terminology to describe the war uh, in a very uncritical fashion. So there's an independence in 1945, but no mention of the state that arises after independence. Uh, they are talking at one point about communist insurrections in Southeast Asia. They are talking about Ho Chi Minh's insurgency against the French. Well, if you talk about insurrection and insurgency, you're taking automatically the side of the powerful and of the Westerners. I mean, Vietnamese would cringe at the idea that what Ho Chi Minh uh, what Ho, Ho Chi Minh's forces uh, uh, represented was an insurgency. It was a national liberation war of a duly constituted uh, independent state. And so we have the countries, South Vietnam and North Vietnam after 1954 when they were in fact only contending states uh, with very tenuous uh, 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 grip on uh, territorial uh, possession. We have the ad nauseum North Vietnam and South Vietnam. Um, the Republic of Vietnam is mentioned first and only. Uh, the Army of the Republic, AKA the Saigon Army, is always uh, called the South Vietnamese, when there were in fact many armed factions of Southerners that were fighting against them as well. Um, and the, as I said, the People's Army becomes the North Vietnamese Army and then in one of the kind of most cruel ironies, uh, the uh, series, in fact, is quite correct in saying that the southern guerrilla forces call themselves the National Liberation Front or the People's Liberation Armed Forces, but were disparaged by their enemies, by the United States and the Saigon government, as uh, the communist traitors to the Vietnamese nation, AKA the Viet Cong. When I saw this, I thought, wow, this is really good. You know, they actually mentioned that this Viet Cong is actually a disparaging term. And then, of course, I'm even more frustrated to see that then they use the word Viet Cong throughout the series. I mean, uh, there is some kind of a disconnect that I cannot make sense of. So, Vietnam was one country and remained one country in the eyes of both combatants, of both contending states 
And when you talk about the North Vietnamese ad nauseum uh, in all 10 episodes of the series, you make them alien in the South. You portray them as having no legitimate reason to be in the South, which they consider their own country, as if they were an invading force from a di discrete country. And so therefore, escalation and war making is subtly uh, uh, um, uh, pointed to as coming from Hanoi. Now, when I talk to my students about these matters, I use an American example and I say, what would you say if some alien force that tried to dominate the United States, it's hard to imagine, but anyway, uh, if there was an alien force that tried to dominate at least the western parts of the United States, would call the United States Army that is now arrayed against them, as every red-blooded American patriot would do, would call the United States Army that has its home base, say, in Ohio or Florida, but operates in the contested west of the Mississippi, would call them the East American Army. Right? You get the drift. Right? You make them illegitimate in their own country. So in conclusion, I want to say that uh, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick had an ex excellent chance uh, to present new perspectives and to really def uh, reflect very deeply. They worked on this 10 years, reflect very deeply on how to achieve a more complex understanding um, of the war and particularly of how the Vietnamese themselves uh, uh, thought about uh, the war. And in that regard, this much wanted and heavily promoted quote unquote new take was, is really a failure. It reaffirms Cold War and Western frames. And the much wanted inclusion of the Vietnamese is really as if you in, uh, include some Vietnamese bit players in an American play, in an American narrative that is unchanged. So Vietnamese inclusion is really a disrespect of the Vietnamese. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Christoph. Uh, I'm sure that we'll revisit this presentation a little later in question and answers. There, these are very important points, and you can't understand this Vietnam unless, unless you are, are aware of these. Our next uh, panelist is Dan Gilman. Dan Gilman is a veteran of the American War in Vietnam serving there as a medic in 1969. He is currently president of Veterans for Peace Chapter 92, and he is a board member of Peace Trees Vietnam. His presentation will focus on the phrase in the first episode that says, quote, the war was begun in good faith by decent men, unquote. <laughs> he will provide some brief context to American foreign policy after World War II, World War I, that help explains why and how the U.S. got into Vietnam. I think you meant World War II. Yes. <clears throat> Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I must say it's um, a little bit intimidating following a real historian. <laughs> and one from an international school of studies at that. <laughs> but he, can, he, he will be able to correct uh, if I make any historical mistakes. So. Well, I want to provide some context uh, to how and why the U.S. evolved itself in Vietnam. Uh, Ken Burns and Lynn Novak provide a little information in this regard, but it seems to me that it is fundamental to an understanding of that war and how we view the film. In the first few minutes of episode one, we hear the narr narrator say that the Vietnam War was a war begun in good faith by decent men. Burns and Novak don't explain what the good faith was or who these decent people were. In fact, it seems like the rest of the film discount those notions. But um, they do mention at the outset that the U.S. wanted to ca contain communism and specifically to help that what they call the country of, of South Vietnam preserve its democracy and to be free from communist North aggression in what they call the Civil War, a Civil War. 
And we have an Eisenhower. He wanted to make sure that Vietnam was not the start to, to falling dominoes. And he didn't want to be blamed for losing Vietnam like Truman lost, was accused of losing China. So uh, Burns and uh, Novick don't break any real new ground here, uh, but they, they buy into the popular dominant narrative that we were there to help bolster democracy and prevent, it, prevent a communist takeover, but along the way we made mistakes in prosecuting the war, leading to withdrawal and defeat of the Americans. Well-meaning but misguided is how one commentator captures this popular understanding. And as uh, Professor Gable uh, referred to the two uh, countries that uh, they called South, South Vietnam, it was uh, the government in Saigon was really unpopular and authoritarian and was really a creation and a puppet regime of the United States dispelling the myth of a leg legitimate government. So what was the real reason for the intervention in Vietnam? Understanding the U.S. post-World War II thinking and for foreign policy beliefs will help us get to an understanding of why we pushed and supported the French to recolonize Vietnam and then pick up virtually where they left off. Right after World War II, the foreign policy of the Cold War with the Soviet Union emerged. As one of the two superpowers, the U.S. saw itself in competition with the Soviet Union for, for, for control of various regions of the world, especially Southeast Asia. But the U.S. emerged as the dominant global power, and its goal was to keep it that way. George Keenan, the U.S. State Department architect of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, wrote a top secret memo in 1948 that stated that the U.S. was about 6% of the world's population, but controlled about 50% of the world's resources. He wrote, the objective of U.S. foreign policy should be to maintain that disparity and, and employ straight power tactics to enforce this global inequity while avoiding all rhetoric, rhetoric about commitment to human rights, raising other people's standard of living, and democratizing and the like. Keenan's vision for the U.S. was, as Professor Paul Atwood says in his book, War and Empire, a globalized economy under firm control of America and allied European banks and industries and backed by American fire, firepower. So the U.S. wanted to, the rich resources of Vietnam to remain in the hands of the capitalist countries and conversely wanted to prevent the Soviets, Soviet Union and China from acquiring these resources even though that country was right in their backyard. As the defeated French left, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles said in Indochina, said of Indochina, it is rich in raw materials such as tin, rubber, and iron ore. And the area has great strategic value with its naval and air bases. In 1947, Truman came out with his doctrine that expanded the Monroe Doctrine, providing military and economic assistance to anywhere in the world where democratic nations were under threat from external and internal author authoritarian forces. There were a few, very few, voices that advised that the U.S. should be on the side of supporting Vietnam's independence, anti-colonial movement. But they were drowned out by, a, out by a succession of presidents and administrations who prioritized control over access to markets and resources for its expanding its industries and corporations. Our interests were open markets, available resources, and hegemony. 
above all else. The film doesn't ask or answer the question as why we would violate our own ideals and values to wage a merciless war on a poor peasant country who had been struggling for hundreds of years to free itself from foreign domination. Hadn't we had our own revolution against the British to form our own independent country centuries ago? And why would we pass up many opportunities to let democracy take its course, most notably refusing to let the election go forward that was scheduled for 1956 under the Geneva Accords? So certainly, I think you can see there was no good faith at work here and no decent men in this, in this history. Our leader's great fault was to ignore or discredit the anti-colonial and national mo movement in Vietnam. This revolution, revolutionary movement turned to the communists because they supported anti-colonial struggles, as Ho Chi Minh writes in his uh, writings. Even at the end of the film, in, in episode 10, Burns and Novak still have no appreciate, appreciation for the Vietnam struggle for independence. The narrator saying that after the U.S. Forest, forces left, the Vietnam people would find themselves back where they were in the beginning, engulfed in, a, in an apparent endless civil war. Really? Well, <laughs> no, in fact, for the vast majority of Vietnamese people, they now saw the light at the end of the tunnel of ending this brutal war with the massive U.S. military support for the South Vietnamese Army removed. They knew victory was at hand. Their unspeakable sacrifice was about to pay off. As much as the military and our government wished to refurbish the war with their Vietnam commemoration that began under Obama, the singular truth that Burns and Novak miss it was, it is that the war was unnecessary and wrong. If they had, had the uh, audacity, I guess you would say, to interview Daniel Ellsberg, he might have said his famous quote, we weren't on the wrong side, we were the wrong side. <laughs> Even Trump's NSA advisor, H.R. McCaster, called the American war in Vietnam one of the greatest foreign policy disasters of the 20th century. Burns and Novak's stated goals for the, for the film is to heal the wounds of the war and reconcile the various opposing groups and find meaning to it all. It's hard to know how that can happen when they miss, miss the truth about the real reasons we entered into the war. Maybe the best thing to do is leave this wound open until we and our government come to terms with who we are as a nation, what we did in Vietnam, and accept the responsibility that we have to heal the destruction we've done to the Vietnamese people and ourselves. Thanks, Dan. Our third panelist is Alan Lusty. Alan served in Vietnam from March 67 to March 68. His first assignment was with an engineering unit that trained tunnel rats, later assigned to the 9th Infantry Division where he became a payroll chief, payroll section chief. After six months, he became a courier flying around the Delta delivering payroll and was shot down a couple of times, a couple of times held hostile groups at bay with gunpoint. Survived the Tet Offensive, transferred to Germany for the rest of his service. Became an athlete and toured Germany wrestling for the support command out of Stuttgart. Finished second in the 1969 European Championships and also recognized as the best conditioned athlete. Elected Oregon coordinator for the Vietnam Veterans Against the War in 1972 and received a peace award in March of 1973. Moved back home to Newburgh, Oregon in 1970, 
1978 and cared for his parents until 1990 when he moved to Seattle. Started PTSD therapy in 2010 and still in therapy. Joined Veterans for Peace in August 2016. Al will portray, uh, talk about the film portrayed VVAW as being, that's Vietnam Veterans Against the War, as being politically active with the SDS, Black Panthers, and other war resisting groups. VVAW wanted to end the war, but also focused on veterans issues which were not mentioned in the film. He will take a little, talk a little bit about the effects of the war on, on the psychic and a brief biography of PTSD. Al. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start out mostly with the uh, session number nine, eight and nine, and uh, the eight, the eighth session. It was. I'm going to start out with uh, session eight and nine. Uh, of the Ken Burns, uh, Kim Novak uh, film. Uh, the eight uh, session was they had a brief interview with the Tunnel Rat, which I'll talk about later. But first I want to get into session number nine where he talked about VVAW and the trail of the VVAW with the Black Panthers and the women's movement and all the other political groups as if we were a political group. Yes, we wanted an end to the war. There, there just is no doubt about that. Although by 19, when I was elected the Oregon coordinator for Vietnam Vets Against the War in 1972, in Oregon alone there was like three and a half thousand members and we had six different chapters. Up to that point we were part of uh, uh, what was referred to as the Pacific Northwest Vietnam Vets Against the War and I, I think Mike was the coordinator through 71. But, and then John Kerry uh, testified before Congress and he came out to Oregon and that's August of 71. Uh, that's when we set up Oregon and split the two just because of the sheer number of veterans that were joining the organization. Uh, at that point, we were uh, recognized about as being the sixth largest uh, veterans organizations. organization. Uh, there was VVF, VFW, American Legion, DAV, and you know, the others. Uh, but in addition to the politicizing or the marching that we were doing, we had a lot more concerns just because of the sheer number of, of people that were uh, joining our group. And it, they were, the VVAW was starting to be looked at as a viable alternative organization to the VFW and the American Legion. And it was just our generation that, you know, we just saw or we were able to communicate and, and confide in each other. Uh, one of the uh, other than the protests and the marching and the politicization and all that, one of the main concerns we had and something that was started in 1971 was uh, rap groups, uh, small groups that were getting together and talking about uh, psychological issues that we were having. Uh, there was a, uh, it started in New York City, there was one in Chicago, one in San Francisco, we had one in Eugene, but between 1971 and 1974, uh, the, the psychologists, psychiatrists were gathering information and they put it together. So by 1974, 1975, we had really, we had like 14, 16 symptoms of what PTSD was, uh, what it was made up of. Uh, our psychiatrists presented it to the American Psychiatric Board. Uh, they turned it down uh, on the basis that it was veteran only basis research, which for the most part it was. So our psychi psychiatrists went out and they got to the women's group, the Black Panthers and other minority groups, went to the universities, and it took them two more years, but they finally got it together. And in 1978, again, they pre presented all the evidence uh, and the findings that they had for PTSD to the American Psychiatric Board, and the psychi Psychiatric Board accepted it. So 1978 was when PTSD became a formal recognized diagnosis. And it's, it's still a little bit, I hear a little bit still at this point where, yeah, it just mostly refers to veterans, but no, no. P PT, any traumatic, ex there's fallout from any traumatic experience, be male, female, child, or whatever. So, and I, I think it's spreading throughout uh, and being recognized as a, just a societal problem. 
The, uh, in addition to the PTSD, likewise in 1978, we started research uh, in 1971, 1972. I, it was folks at the University of Oregon were working with people at uh, Stanford University. And Rachel Carson came out with her book, uh, Silent Springs, uh, and she uh, did some research into the effects of the uh, Agent Orange the oxide in the water tables. When I left Vietnam in 68, we were already starting to hear about the, the deformities, the birth defects that were coming out. And, and I think it was the cause was the Agent Orange at that point was starting to get into the water tables. So we knew by 68 that, and then, I don't know if it was ever reported, but anyway, uh, then Rachel Carson came out with uh, Silent Springs, her book that uh, did some of the research into the uh, dioxins, the effects that they have on the human body. And uh, then by 1978, our group at Oregon and Stanford, there was enough evidence put together where uh, we got an out-of-court settlement with the chemical companies and they said yes. The amount that we, especially the amount that we sprayed on Vietnam had a negative effect on people and on us. Up to that point, up to that point it was a typical military thing where the Pentagon was saying with the guys that were, folks that were coming down with skin cancer, liver cancer, breakout of, of sores. It's like, oh, you're probably smoking too much opium or taking too much, you're drinking too much or you're pot smoking. But Again, 1978, we did get an out of court settlement against the chemical companies in the United States that they had to recognize and start paying for treatment. Oh, sorry. Anyway, the conclusion of that is 1978, we, we got it, the out of court settlement with the uh, Dow, Dow Jones and the chemical companies that they were the, the uh, potency of their the Agent Orange that they were using in Vietnam caused cancer, deformities, and we got an out-of-court settlement and they, and they started taking responsibility for paying for some of the uh, treatment. And then in, as VVAW, we came back together again and we put together a leaflet and we started going out in Oregon and, and screening the veterans so they could start coming in and reporting in and, and getting treatment for their Agent Orange. Uh, another thing that uh, the VVAW did was, uh, uh, and it showed it, it was it presented itself in one of the episodes. I'm not sure which one it was, but the medical evacuation. They, by, by the time somebody got wounded, till they could get evacuated back to a medical trauma unit, was about 15 to 17 minutes, and that's pretty fast. Uh, our Ohio district. Uh, the coordinator there and, and the folks, they started working with the uh, Ohio State Police and they started using some of our helicopter uh, rescue techniques, uh, first respondents. Uh, anyway, that's where all that got started and, it, and any, any, it's all over now. I mean, it's, it's helicopter evacuation and the first responders. I mean, it, it's just, just, that's just the state of the art as it is anymore. But anyway, that got started in the early, mid-70s, 73, 74, when we started working with them. Um, during 1974, uh, our group got uh, indicted by uh, a problem we came across or issue we had was uh, 19, uh, actually 1972, we had eight veterans out of the VVAW that were indicted for uh, conspiracy and uh, charges that were, uh, we were going to incite uh, violence during the uh, Republican National Convention in Miami. Uh, some of that can be seen in Ron Kovic's uh, movie, Born on the Fourth of July, where that takes place. but. Uh, Anyway, it took us uh, three years and about $425,000 to uh, get the court and they had, the federal government had to drop the case because uh, the problem that uh, they were presenting for themselves was the agent provocateurs that they were hiring to testify against us were crazy. They were just nuts. And, and they were coming into the courtrooms and the judge was like, oh my gosh, here we go again. So yeah, I had, they ended up throwing it out of court. In fact, I was in St. Louis working on the uh, 
a case and uh, we got uh, the call from Gainesville where the, our, our case was going on and uh, we heard that it got dismissed and everybody, whew, wow, that's what a, tr good. Uh, the rumor that came out of it is that uh, they, they, William Kunksler, I, you may know, anyway, he was our lawyer. And uh, there was just a recess, and uh, so our guys went back to the, uh, their wait room, or whatever you call it, and uh, we're, they're waiting to be called back in. Just sitting there, you know, just chatting of, you know, what do we do next, and all that kind of stuff. Suddenly they, they, were, they heard this banging in a closet, and one of the guys got up and went over the closet, and of all things, there were some coat hangers that were in the closet, and then there was a couple of agents, FBI agents, that were in the uh, closet, and just accidentally, they bumped them, and and then so Kunksler went down to the judge and said, "You know, you, you got to throw this thing out." It did, and so out it went. Uh, I, I, other things that I'll just be brief about other things that uh, VVAW was involved in is with discharge upgrading. It, other things that the VVAW was, was involved in was uh, discharge upgrading. It was our point of view that we would have liked to have seen discharges, just have a general discharge. If you go in and if you have to get out for medical reasons or if you get discharged for less than honoring, that doesn't matter. Just, just Get, just issue a general discharge, uh, a dishonorable discharge, a medical discharge, or uh, any adverse other than the honorary discharge. Uh, at that time in the '70s, if you went to your employer, they they could ask you for what they could ask you for your discharge, and I just discharged it. They have codes on it as to where you were and, and what you did and what kind of discharge you got, which really interfered with your employability. Uh, and then uh, as far as jobs go, another problem that we had was those that hadn't been drafted yet uh, to try to get a job and if their employer would ask them, have you been in the military yet? And they said, no, or it's like you, you, couldn't, you, didn't, you couldn't get a job. We, it, civilian issue plus, and then on the veteran side, jobs, us coming out of the military. Uh, one of the things that the UW can be proud of with themselves is 1971, they graduated their first class of physician's assistants. It was the, uh, a lot of corpsmen, uh, the medics and, doc medics and doctors, uh, nurses got together and they put together a, a two-year program and they graduated in 1971 and within a couple of years that went all over. Harvard picked up on it. Uh, the, the, uh, Ivy League schools, Berkeley, Stan and so within a couple of years, every the major universities had a physician's assistance program, but it all came out of UW and non-VVAW. Some might have been VVAW, but anyway, they were just veterans that came back and, and got together. Our, our issue in, in Oregon that we had was we had folks like that that were coming back in and uh, you know, trying to get like triage folks, nurses, I mean, that had seen the worst. Trying to get a job, the only thing they could do, and the only openings that there were in the hospitals down there were for like orderlies. And their, their only job was to keep bedpans clean. And it's sort of like, whoa, 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 you're missing. Anyway, it, they have to be applauded, the UW, the, the first group that put themselves together and then went through um, again, just a couple of the other things, well, discharge upgrading, and then we also were like a speaker's bureau where we sent people out and we would talk to different groups, the veteran groups or high schools, colleges. Um, and that's, I, I think that's about the only addition I have I've, as far as making you aware of the other activities, you know, other than just the political group that is being shown in the, the ninth series, it, there was, it was a whole lot of stuff that just went on and that it was almost like a, okay, this week let's go out and let's march and it was almost like a secondary issue, the protest itself. Uh, as far as my experience with the, uh, being a tunnel rat um, and, and the effects on the uh, psychic it had, has, 
I, I think the first thing, well, I was very well trained in, 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 in my bio. I was a good wrestler, so I, I didn't worry about confronting anybody or having to defend myself because I was very confident in myself being able to take care of business. Uh, and then I was trained with this, uh, by the uh, CIA with a master and he trained us how to kill if we had to really get into a one-on-one -on -one situation with a person. I think that uh, after the training and once I got out with the engineering unit, the first thing I would ask in the morning, where are the flamethrowers? I, I wanted to know where the flamethrowers were, just in case we ran across a tunnel and had to go down. I wanted to give it a blast of uh, flamethrower so I had some chance and then go down. But uh, I think what it does is uh, my foundation, my parents, we, we did a lot in the church. I was very Christian and very just a good kid. Uh, that went out the window in a heartbeat. You know, I, it, 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 I became very existentialist. Uh, I defined my universe. Uh, I don't. I don't like people touching me. I, I didn't, didn't like. I don't like people touching me. Uh, I'm a very hyper vigilant. But I noticed movement. Uh, I got into the attitude of being very existentialist. Of you know, if something happens or I have to shoot somebody, well then you know, shit happens. Uh, I was, got numbed out real quick. I, I think that was my survival, or that's what allowed me or got me through a lot of the experience. Uh, I still I'm going through. PTSD therapy now. I've been in it five years, and it took about three years for my counselor to make me realize that war turns people into savages. It, it just does stuff to people that it's just not civil at all. I didn't, it took me three years to finally realize, okay, 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 I get it. Uh, but still, and then with the, assess, with the assessment that uh, I went through my first three years, we, there's a lot of stuff that bothers me about war, but we got down to two things, and it was the killing and then the loss of my friends. That, that, that those two things just grabbed me. I still have problems with uh, watching TV, or in the, the worst one that there's, I still black, I black out every once in a while when I see shootings. And the worst one for me was uh, Sandy Hook, when all the children, you know, but my mind is, it, it's just like Al, uh, you're going out, you're checking out here, you better sit down. And, and that was part of my therapy too, was having things around so I could grab, to ground myself so that, and it, I've always been curious, I don't know how long I black out for, but you know, I, I come back in, but I know how to ground myself. Uh, but it, anyway, the effects of war. Um, the numbing, uh, I think that, well, anyway, that was what kept me going uh, and surviving. And I, I'm, the part of the therapy I'm in now is I'm at the tail end of it where within the last six months for me, I've, I'm, I'm getting past this existentialist way of being. And it was just a couple of weeks ago, last week, where I, was, I, saw, I saw some children play. And, and I, I stopped. And I watched them, and I thought, oh, aren't, I mean, they, they were just playing. They, they were just doing what six and seven year olds do grab each other, push each other, run, scream. And I, I stood there and I watched them, and it was the first time that in 40, 45 years where I was realizing that, wow, look at that, man, isn't that cool? You know, and then, so I'm just within the last six months, I would say, coming out of. You know, five years of therapy where I'm starting to see and experience life. But I, I think that is the effect that war has on the psychic. It, it just shuts it down and you numb yourself out. And I don't do drugs or drink or so. I don't have that problem. It, but there still is the psychic problem. Um, and that's about all I have to say. Thanks, Al. I hope you won't mind you. We were talking, I was talking with Al uh, oh, a few months back and comparing notes on PTSD, which I, I'm also um, have. 
and uh, he was Al was saying that when he as part of the uh, procedure to get ready to go into a tunnel they used uh, some of the teachings of Thich Nhat Hanh who is some of you probably some of you know is a Vietnamese pacifist Buddhist monk and I said, you're kidding me, and, you, and this is what, 1971? 1967. 67. And I said, well, uh, well, that's interesting. I, I had some PTSD therapy sessions when I was in, at the VA, and this is about six, seven years ago, and I'm sitting in a circle with the mostly Vietnam veterans and some Gulf War veterans, and we are using handouts from Thich Nhat Hanh on mindfulness and breathing and my, mindfulness walking, that sort of thing. So. Uh, I suppose there's no irony in that, but uh, it, it's a pretty strange fact of the of the war that uh, um, <laughs> he's using he's being used as as a therapist and a calmer for tunnel rats and also for PTSD. Um, so last is me. I'm I'm a I'm a drafty Vietnam veteran who worked as an army intelligence analyst and interrogator linguist with the 525 Military Intelligence Group in, in Vietnam in 1968. I returned to the U.S. in 19... Uh, I returned to the U.S. and was active in Vietnam Veterans Against the War and served as Washington Regional Coordinator for VVAW in 1971. I've been a member of the Veterans for Peace Chapter 92 since, since 2003 and I served as the first uh, chapter president. My essay is on veterans, anti-war activists, and respect. Uh, Burns interviewed several people uh, in the series, but basically there were uh, sort of ad lib, ad, almost ad hominem comments about spitting on uh, veterans and the way veterans were dis uh, Vietnam veterans were disrespected by, particularly uh, by anti-war activists. Uh, so I've got some personal remarks about that, but I also uh, uh, want to quote some remarks that were done by other people who wrote on the subject. The first one was by Jerry Lemby, who wrote a book called The Spitting Image. Now, in 1960, uh, 19, uh, 19, was it, he wrote that in 1998? Uh, Lemke, Lemke uh, in, insisted that most of the stories, or if not all the stories of uh, veterans getting spit on, were undocumented and unbogus. Uh, I'll, I'll quote him directly. Quote, stories of spat on Vietnam veterans have become so ingrained in the American discourse about war and veterans that they can now be re referenced matter-of-factly with no acknowledgement of their mythical uh, properties. Their migration from bar stools to the higher cultural ground of literary trope as in assisted by mainstream news organizations, which, with few exceptions, repeat the spit on stories uncritically. I quote uh, on the same line, I quote from a um, Diane Mazur, who is a specialist in civil relations and advisor to the National Institute of Military Justice. Quote, there is no contemporaneous evidence that Americans who opposed the war expressed these beliefs by spitting on or otherwise assaulting returning Vietnam veterans. The idea, however, that spitting on or mistreating Vietnam veterans was in any way typical or representative of anything in that era is completely false. It is by far the most powerful Vietnam veteran mem, a cultural unit of information passed from one person to another, like biological genes, because it can be deployed instantly to silence difficult but necessary conversations about the military. For that reason alone, the conventional wisdom is important because it explains how much about our civil military dynamic today. It is also important, however, to understand why that accepted memory is untrue and who benefits most from keeping it alive. On a slightly similar but also a different twist, Christian Appy wrote, my own view is that spitting stories are largely mythic, but that myth itself reflects the deep anger and animosity that many veterans harbored toward the anti-war movement. Their anger often reflected a sense of class injustice that gave their more privileged peers greater freedom to avoid the war. Across the gulf of class and experience, it was hard not to believe 
as was sometimes the case, that all anti-war critics judged veterans as immoral participants in an immoral war. Not all veterans believed that was the case, but many did and still do, regardless of the fact that the anti-war movement generally focused on its condemnations on American policymakers, and regardless of some veterans' own deep, if conflicted, doubts about the war. Many of these same veterans felt at least as defiled by right-wing flag wavers as by anti-war protesters. He based his conclusions on extensive interviews he had conducted with Vietnam veterans since the 1980s. Behaviorist a scientist Norman Zinberg, who wrote about this issue, states, it just seems probable that it, spitting, must have happened somewhere, sometime. I find it hard to imagine that no soldier was ever spat upon by an anti-war protester. The real question is whether it occurred with any degree of frequency. Did it happen all the time, or was just isolated examples? Personally, I would guess it happened infrequently. True Lindgren, another commentator on, on the uh, spitting issue, has unearthed stories of spitting from this time, seemingly un upended Lemke's point of view. But these are drop in the bucket compared to the over 500,000 Americans that sought in some capacity during the war. Actually, there were three, almost three million. The issue of spitting during the Vietnam War may, see, may seem small, even irrelevant today. However, it's important to remember the role that the spitting imagery has played in America's current military conflicts. In many ways, this stab in the back legend has led to the current support the troops slogan, which is based on the idea that we don't like, if we don't want to treat today's soldiers like we treated the Vietnam veterans. And what some would argue that to support the troops is really nothing more than a slogan used by pro-war hawks to intimidate anti-war doves and maintain support for wars that would otherwise be increasingly unpopular. Clearly, some of the spitting stories are true, but the majority are second and third hand with no photographic evidence or first hand journalism to document the in incidents. The politics of the spitting stories, that the anti-war movement was anti-soldier, is what's fundamentally false, even if a handful of spitting, tor spitting Tories turn out to be true. My own experience as a longtime anti-war veteran is that in 50 years of activism, I never saw or heard any incidents of disrespect directed at soldiers. Rather, the opposite were true, was true. Veterans who were welcomed into the anti-war movement were looked up to, respected, and provided much appreciated leadership. Many people will be surprised about the mistreatment of Vietnam veterans from World War II and Korean War veterans. Howard Darter, a Vietnam veteran and American Legion official in Southern California, said he knows why Vietnam vets have ignored the American Legion and the VFW. Quote, the truth is that when Vietnam vets came back, they were shunned by the Legion and other veterans groups. They were looked down upon, Darter said. The wall started coming down about 15 years ago, but for some Vietnam veterans, that wall will always be there. They can't forget how they were treated. Servicemen returning from World War II were all seen as, quote, coming back a better person because they helped save democracy, unquote. Uh, Moscos, who's another writer about military, uh, uh, military in America. The general feeling about among many Americans was that anyone who for, returned from Vietnam was a bad person into drugs and disassociated from society. John Lynch, an army captain who is secretary of the Vietnam Veterans of America Chapter 785 in Orange County, California, said that he has no interest in ever joining the American Legion or VFW. It's not because I don't believe in what they do, but the VVA's work reflects more of the issues and opinions which I as a Vietnam am interested in seeing addressed. And Al addressed that question quite well. He said they include the plight of homeless vets, Agent Orange, and an initiative to help Vietnamese families in Vietnam locate the remains of missing soldiers. We don't we don't have halls or bars where guys go to drink. We don't do any of that, Lynch said. We come to meetings ready to discuss issues that are of importance to Vietnam vets and their families. Garton, the World War II vet, says he does not re resent Vietnam vets for not joining the Legion. You can't blame these guys for feeling that way. People frowned on them, and they don't want to belong to anything where they weren't wanted. 
The disrespect shown to Vietnam veterans was a motiv motivating for force for the establishment of Vietnam Veterans of America, with some of the original founders being members of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. VVA is the only such organization chartered by the United States Congress and dedicated to Vietnam veterans and their families. The group holds a congressional charter under Title 36 of the U.S. Code. Its founding principle is, quote, never again will one generation <coughs> of veterans abandon another, <coughs> unquote. You might have noticed that three of the veterans in the interview of the series were uh, 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 Musgrave, Tim O'Brien, and um, Al Earhart. They were all members of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. So that's that's our presentation for now. We're gonna uh, we have to do something with our microphones, I think, to get her commentary. So just bear with us for a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and, and what, what mic have you got for the audience? Did you have a remote? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're going to use one of the mics on the table, so you'll have to come up to um, the table, probably this one. Or this one, any of the mics. If uh, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, uh, somebody pointed out earlier that there are a fair number of younger people in the audience, and I would we would welcome comments or questions from the younger generation. Uh, and I assume that some of this is actually quite a uh, new experience for many of the, these people. So uh, you can, if you feel like it. Uh, talk from the audience, and I can repeat the questions here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the, the, the comment was about the number of, uh, of active duty and uh, veterans who were actually locked up in the states and, and who were resisted the war and were locked up basically for that uh, objection. Uh, it might be, you should be aware that locally here, uh, Fort Lewis was, a, was one of the areas where there was an active, active uh, group of people called the Shelter Half and other organization. There were uh, uh, dozens of uh, uh, anti-war magazines and anti-war active duty veterans organizations throughout the country. Uh, Fort Lewis was one. Uh, that's uh, something that I was going to talk about, but uh, it's a big subject, but it's nonetheless an important one. And the role of active duty service men and women opposing the war, some of them who were in the in, ended up being in, in jail, is an important and not very well known part of the Vietnam experience. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I uh, was also I also served on a uh, amnesty committee during the uh, and reported to the uh, Ford administration, 
Uh, I was with the Amnesty International. I represented the Vietnam Vets Against the War. Uh, there was a Cal clergy and laity concern, a Catholic religious organization. But anyway, the Vietnam Vets Against War, our position on amnesty was universal, unconditional amnesty. And our basic points were, this is, was a, this is our leaflet, that, uh, and this is our statement. We had three points. One of them is all military resistors, so-called deserters, and draft resistors in exile, they should be pardoned. The, the, I've left that out. But anyway, all these people should be pardoned. Uh, the second group is all people who are or have been as civilian and military in uh, who are in civilian and military prisons or those who are sought for uh, prosecution because of their opposition to the war. This includes a clearing of all their records and then uh, the more than half million uh, veterans with less than honor dishonorable or this less than honorable discharges. But those were the three people that we were pushing for to ha be pardoned and, and let free. Uh, the 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 amnesty book that came out, there was three positions. Ours was, we were lied to basically, let, let's let this thing go. Uh, then there's, there was a congressman, I think he was from Tennessee, Mr. Reshner. Uh, he was saying like, prosecute them all, send them all to jail. Let, let's execute them or do whatever we have to do, make them, let's punish them. And then there was Mark Hatfield from Oregon who wanted a case by case uh, review. Uh, eventually uh, for compromised and he did the case by case review but I just want to let you know that the Vietnam vets against the war were totally for universal unconditional amnesty my name is Pablo Stanfield and um, I really appreciated hearing what people had to say tonight I don't know um, how much we were talking about Ken Burns or how much we were reviewing facts from the 60s. But as a person who lived through it, um, I have a lot to say and I'm going to try and keep it to three points. Good uh, Methodist sermon uh, idea. But um, I did not go to Vietnam. I never served in the military. I was a CO. But um, my case went with a bundle of others clear to the Supreme Court where it was declared that <clears throat> local draft boards did not have the right to disqualify COs simply because they needed to keep their body count up. Um, but I discovered watching the Ken Burns series in the third one, I had to turn off the TV and leave because my PTSD was re-stimulated partly by the spin. I have always questioned the idea that Ken Burns is God and can speak with absolute truth, which seems to be the popular idea in the press. Um, <laughs> but I realized, you know, the stories that were being told were being spun right there and I realized I couldn't watch anymore because the same feelings of protesting the war in the 70s. I worked hard in that war and to bring support the troops by bringing them home. And the same stories were coming back and I realized, oh my God, the Vietnam War isn't over yet. And I know that for those of you who went it's never over. Um, but I come from an old Republican family. I also come from a pacifist family on one side. And um, one of the things that the series did show me, the bits and pieces I saw of later episodes, I couldn't sit, I never was able to sit through another episode after the beginning of the third one. Um, I was married to a Vietnam vet who suffered PTSD very badly. I have a brother-in-law who was a PTSD-enhanced uh, Vietnam vet. I 
I, as an anti-war activist, know a lot of Vietnam vets. I know a lot more than some of my uh, right-wing friends who claim to be supporters of Vietnam and the war. Um, and they all continue to say the ca same kinds of things. Oh, we lost the war because of you guys, because you took the air out of the balloon or something. And I heard more of that coming out of Ken Burns, that, that myth that we lost the war because of the, the home front. And I don't believe that for a second. But the most important thing for me was, a few years ago, I went to my 50th class reunion. And it turned out we didn't have nearly as many people killed in Vietnam as we thought. But we had a whole lot of people that were killed because of Vietnam in the years after they came home. And even though I came from a town that was totally Republican and 108 today, I mean, there's still people there who voted for Trump and think it would be a great idea if um, their grandkids went off to war wherever Trump wants to have the next one. Um, <clears throat> but the mythology building of this whole 10 part episode, that's a lot of money and 10 years of work to build a myth in the name of truth. Those of us who lived through it remember being told by Eisenhower this was a good thing. Yes, those people were good people who thought they were doing the right thing. So were my ancestors who marched west with Manifest Destiny and killed Indians. So was Columbus when he conquered, he, he came to the New World, and the Pope told him, because you're Christian and those people there aren't, you have the power to take their land away from them. And it's a policy written into the law still this day. And we continue to pass on those myths as if they were facts, just like the spitting on the, on the Vietnam veteran. When, when Carter tried to reinstate the draft, the people that worked hardest with those of us who were COs were Vietnam veterans who had been drafted. And I had friends who fled to Canada. And that's the part that I want us to think about is, yes, the home front was as traumatic to many of us as being in the war. The constant fights, the constant, the marches in the streets, the pictures in the newspaper, None of us will forget the picture of the girl running with new palm or the picture of the guy shooting, the, the picture, excuse me, the movie of the actual guy being killed. Because it's part of a long series of myth building. And I want us to think about the Vietnam War as a religious battle. It's a spiritual malaise that says white Anglo-Saxon Americans get to conquer the world and use 50% of the world's resources because it's our right, it's our manifest destiny, and the Truman Doctrine was just one more step in that. And the thing that I thought we had learned, which was that the people of America don't really believe that, has been thrown out the window by the current in unelected inhabitant of the White House. And we have, again, this idea, make America strong again. What he means is let white America tromp on people of color and tromp all over the world. I worked in Central America during the Reagan Wars in the 80s. And I doing a little study about the history of US relationship with Central America. The first ambassador to Central America, which once upon a time was a single country, was given explicit instructions. Go down there, keep the British and the French out, and make sure you procure rights to all the natural resources of those countries and take them away from the natives. Nothing has changed in the hundred and some years since that happened. So I want us to stop and think about how we were all impacted by having the war in our homes every night on the five o'clock news, how we were all impacted by our friends, by the draft. I don't care what anybody says. Any guy who lived through the draft knew fear in the deep part of his guts. And everybody I knew in the 60s and 70s was trying to get out of the draft. And you can't tell me there was nobody who did that, even the people who volunteered like my brother we're trying to get out of the draft. 
But it was a spiritual thing, and it has left a spiritual malaise. And Ken Burns just reinforced it. Thank you for your, your patience. Thank you for your comments. Could you come up and use the mic? OK, all right. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't like Ken Burns. He, in the 80s, said I pick uh, projects that GM will finance. So I had very low expectations for this, this series. I couldn't, I, it was hard to get through the first episode. But what I think it accomplished, and I think I have a different spin on it, is that we right now have a culture that its foreign policy is out of sight, out of mind. And we don't discuss it. Bernie Sanders, most progressive, politician my lifetime. Where was the foreign policy discussion? Not in there at all. And I think this is as far as you're going to get with an analysis with Bank of America financing. I mean, we're not going to have a critique of US imperialism. But what it did accomplish, I think, was show that war is hell, that our government lied to us, that the people we supported were repressive and corrupt. And that, I think, is as good as you're going to get. And I think it lends an opportunity to think about what we are doing in other parts of the world right now. What are the good guys that we're supporting in Iraq? Who are the good guys we're supporting in Afghanistan? You know, it's the same kind of story. I don't think it takes much political analysis to shift the lessons from the overwhelming um, apolitical path. It's not apolitical because he does trash the anti-war movement in different ways, but I think that's necessary. <laughs> but um, I mean, from his perspective. But it accomplishes a tremendous thing culturally when we are blinded to what we're doing in the world right now. Thank you. Uh, can you come up and use the mic here, please? Hi, my name is Olivia, and I'm a student at the UW. Um, and my question was actually, um, I was watched an interview with Ken Burns, and he was talking about how he thought the Vietnam War had influenced our current political agenda and the current politics of our time. And actually, I was reading um, Nothing Ever Dies as Well, which is the new book out about the Vietnam War. And he opens his book with a quote. Um, oh, sorry. He opens a uh, new book on the Vietnam War, Nothing Ever Dies. And he opens his. Uh, Tell us who the author is. Uh, Win. Um, Vietnam. Vietnam. And he opens his book with a quote by Martin Luther King that says, um, "If America's soul becomes totally poisoned, part of the autopsy must read Vietnam." So I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about how you feel the Vietnam War has influenced the current political situation within the US, and um, kind of what's come out of it, and where you think it might lead next. Thank you. Thank you. Would, would you like to chew on that, Christoph? <laughs> Go ahead. Oh. Well, do you want to, Dan? Well, <clears throat> um, that's a. That's, uh, <clears throat> statement that's a good intro into lessons not learned. <laughs> uh, for one thing, uh, they certainly don't let journalists uh, uh, move around like they did in the Vi Vietnam War and, and where we saw that uh, carnage and, and whatnot. And so that's a, uh, that's a big change. But, um, you know, I mean, Beth was right about the, uh, you know, we don't uh, we don't talk much. The American people are not very savvy like they are on some of the domestic issues about foreign policy. And so we don't, uh, we just sort of say, well, uh, let's l just let the government take care of it. And, and um, so, uh, you know, the gentleman was talking about the anti-war movement and how they were accused of, um, 
uh, losing the war, well, I think that's a badge of courage that they were able to help stop the war. I mean, the anti-war movement was massive. Uh, it, it wasn't really shown in the in the film, but you know, the, the, there were uh, thousands of coffee houses all around the the country. There was all these underground GI and anti-war newspapers that were. Um, th that had a lot to do with getting people involved in anti-war movements. So, um, but the, of course, the difference uh, today is we've got we've got seven wars going on, and we don't have uh, anything like the response that happened in the um, '60s and '70s to help in that war. So. Um, I just wanted to add a, a comment to that, particularly about the uh, uh, what's shocking to a lot of people, and it's, even for me as a Vietnam veteran, is to see of the images of the dead and the carnage generally in, in this this thing, and it is if really the only lesson the United Na uh, United States military learned from Vietnam, and that is you don't let journalists cover your wars. Yeah. So we don't have the, basically the same sort of carnage in Af Iraq and Afghanistan. You don't see that on your TV. Or, you know, sure. most recently in, in Africa, we just had three special forces soldiers who were killed down there. What the hell are we doing down there? Well, they're, they're fighting wars. Um, so thank you for your comment. Uh, why don't you go ahead and if I could just uh, make Actually, a brief um, comment. I have a if I if I may just sorry. just sure. uh, answer Olivia's question too. Um, speak into it. Okay. Um, is it better now? Um, you know that, that's that's an extremely uh, apt quote by Martin Luther King Jr. Um, the Vietnam War uh, poisoning. America's soul, and I would I would think because Vietnam, uh, as it was um, shown on the nightly news, and it, as it became known through the tales of returning soldiers, um, it led to what we might call cognitive dissonance, right? It because it went straight against uh, the very deep-seated mythologies about America, um, America as a kind of a chosen nation, uh, providentially supported um, uh, on the side of good, uh, standing out of, outside of history, uh, that historical forces did not apply to America because it was um, providentially set up to, to bring good and freedom to the world. And uh, I think that, that went fundamentally against these uh, deep mythologies. And in many ways, uh, at least one side of American society has tried to reinstall that that mythology about America and fighting Vietnam on that, on that uh, uh, account. Um, and it's also not an accident that it was Martin Luther King uh, who, who said this because uh, he was, of course, fighting on the forefront against white supremacy. He, he, he knew it. He experienced it all his life. And, um, and uh, you know, white supremacy lay at the foundation of American intervention in Vietnam. Thank you. Uh, so brief comment. Um, Martin Luther King, during the last 100 days of his life, uh, bo a book written by Tavis Smiley, I think, uh, he was uh, totally up, ag uh, up against the uh, war in Vietnam. And um, uh, he was warned against it and warned that he would have to pay. And apparently he did. Um, I have a comment. Uh, one of the, uh, I'm not sure how Ken Burns dealt with the uh, class differential. Uh, part of the uh, uh, I was also drafted, and I, I was in Vietnam, 67, 68, and, um, and uh, it seemed to me that I was surrounded by a whole bunch of poor people, man, you know. Uh, they were, there were um, uh, guys from the uh, cities, uh, Mexicans, uh, uh, guys from the hills of Virginia, uh, people from, uh, and they were all poor. It was the very beginning of the war. And uh, it's, it, it impressed upon me how, how uh, later on the, uh, 
the uh, the struggle against the war was uh, was uh, sort of uh, expressed by the United States when um, the others their kids started coming out of college because that's what you did you know you sent your kid to college and he didn't have to go to war uh, guys like me who graduated from high school or some of some people who didn't at that time were were drafted we were made officers because there were and uh, you know they just gave us a break how would you like to be the best officer in the you know the, the officer in the best army in the world things of that nature and this uh, impresses us so we went to war um, but I realized that we're not the only ones the class system is still the same what you do is you get a little bit of uh, economic difficulties going on and, and an open arm from our armed forces and guess what? You have a whole volunteer army. That's where my grandkids are going and your children as well. Uh, you get the, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's always there and it's always been there. It wasn't just me. I wasn't the only pawn. And uh, part of that existential uh, aspect is that once I gave my oath during the drafting process, I accepted the war as mine. So I'm guilty of not having the courage to uh, go the other route. And I'm guilty of, uh, of taking the oath, saying, and the war became mine. I always felt the victim. It's so easy to be a victim. And I just wanted to make that comment uh, to really think about, I think part of the process that Ken's Burns uh, uh, show did uh, is, the, is, the, is the fact that each one of us has a story that goes contra whatever it is that they're trying to disseminate to everybody else. And uh, it's important that we go around and we make these comments, we make these things because people have to know we were there. These gentlemen were all there. You've been affected by it by one way or the other. And we're there to make sure. So every once in a while I tell someone that, hey, look, you know, they drafted me because I was poor. I had no way of, I couldn't get into the, uh, to the reserves like uh, a couple of our uh, uh, senators. And I, I couldn't, I didn't have like bunions on my foot, so I couldn't go in, you know. That would, so anyway, I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you for that comment. Uh, just on a, a follow-up uh, quickly on what you said, I don't know if people know this, but during the, the, the 60s when the draft was on for an American male up for the draft, unless you could get a deferment, you, your choices were going into the military, accepting the draft. Uh, if you were lucky, you could be a CO, which was not an easy thing to get. Uh, you could go to Canada, you could, in which case you would be a, uh, a fugitive. You could go underground, or you could be a fugitive. There weren't, or you could actually go to the war. I mean, these are not, the, or prison, prison, of course. If these are not good choices, none of them. Go ahead. We're actually, actually, Dan wanted to make a quick comment here. <laughs> I don't know how quick it be. Um, well, there's an excellent, speaking of the draft, there's an excellent movie <laughs> on the draft and the Vietnam generation in our first, uh, comment by Beth Sanders uh, is the filmmaker of that uh, movie if you, you should get uh, you should see it but uh, the gentleman is correct about uh, the Vietnam war being a working class war it was the poor and working class that made up 85% of those that uh, fought in, in in the war in Vietnam uh, Christian Appy has a great book uh, on on the subject called the working class war and um, it talks about um, all the all the data and demographics of that but uh, one of the little known th uh, f facts uh, r related to uh, getting getting more men into into the fighting force was McNamara had this thing he called a hundred thousand I don't know if you've heard of it but what what he did he said well we've got we've got to give these uh, 
men who, who flunked the um, I, IQ test for the military. And, well, in some cases, the physical. We got to lower the, the IQ requirements. And so they were trying to fill the ranks with those who really were the least fit uh, to, to take on this uh, horrendous task. And it was one of the, um, I think, one of the real sorry chapters in, in the draft uh, by doing that. But uh, it, it definitely was a working class war. And there was a lot of middle class. There were a lot of ways that they could get out. I Thanks, to, Dan. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. My name is Jenna. I'm a professor in anthropology here at, at UW. And I want, my name is Jenna. I'm a professor of anthropology at, at UW here. And I just wanted to thank you all so much. I really enjoyed all of your comments. Um, I'm teaching a class about Cambodia right now. And I'm curious what you all think of the series and how it's handled the war as a regional event that really shaped Cambodia, for example, Laos, even Thailand, the formation of ASEAN, and or sort of what ASEAN was doing, the association of Southeast Asian nations. Um, I haven't seen a lot of it, so I can't comment in detail. But I was just curious what your thoughts were about that. I'll try again. Yeah. All right. Um, Well, it's uh, it's a tough one, actually, a tough question. Um, you know, I'm you're a Cambodia person. I'm a Vietnam person. You know, um, so we have our academic biases. Um, so, on one level, I want to say uh, Cambodia and Laos in the colonial empire of Indochina were indeed backwaters. Um, uh, the big prize for the French and the big prize for American intervention was always Vietnam uh, in terms of sheer numbers, economic resources, and so on. Um, that said, I think um, Cambodia is a particularly um, uh, tragic um, case in the larger Indochina, in the second larger Indochina war, uh, because it... Um, and I don't think the series is very good in portraying that because it tried desperately uh, throughout the 1960s to stay out of what I call the vortex of, of violence that took place on its eastern border. And it did this in savvy, wily uh, uh, ways, full of compromise, full of selling the war partings out to one another, uh, applying both of their... Um, all of their uh, um, prerogatives, um, you know, giving intelligence to all, so to say. Um, the, uh, at a very basic level, um, that was what made Cambodia's neutrality work in the 1960s and stay out of violence. And I don't think it's, it's hy hyperbole to say that Richard Nixon was the one who willfully destroyed Cambodia, a Cambodian neutrality, and sucked it into the war and unleashed all of these forces um, uh, from Lonol's uh, royalist army to uh, the, the uh, later on autogenocidal uh, Khmer Rouge that just devastated the country in ways that even Vietnam was not devastated. Uh, to this day in, in terms of the sheer um, uh, collective trauma that, that uh, Cambodia still under, undergoes. Um, Ken burns Novick had 18 hours. It's criminally short for a very complex uh, issue. As I already mentioned in my remarks, even on the Vietnamese side, it is uh, it is extremely simplistic in in the ways that uh, the filmmakers set it up. Um, uh, Cambodia would have uh, demanded uh, again a much more uh, nuanced 
and, and empathetic treatment that it, that it received in the series. And in some ways that goes for Laos as well. Uh, both Laos and Cambodia underwent kind of the Vietnam War in fast forward, very, very um, condensed a few years of utter and sheer violence uh, in which you had pro-Western, pro-communist and neutralist forces, very identifiable, uh, very similar to Vietnam. Yes. So thank you for your comment. I want to thank you guys too. This is awesome. I'm one of those guys who got a general. General discharge under honorable conditions. But anyway, on May 3rd of 1970, my unit in the first calf went into Cambodia. My company lost seven dead and 29 wounded on that day. On May 5th, what we had done is taken the biggest cache site that was ever taken in the war. So the press was there every day. And a reporter came up to me and he said, somebody had told him that I had killed a quote enemy. So he said, he asked me what I thought about that. And because of seven dead, and 29 wounded, I had to say I felt good. And then he said, do you know right now that people are shutting down campuses across the country? What do you think about that? And I said, that's really fucking good. And we were glad because we had heard about Kent State. We'd heard about it. And when we were getting resupplied on May 7th, a door gunner, door gunner told us about students being massacred, killed and murdered to bring us home. And I've had been lucky enough to go back to Kent State two times to talk to those students and thank them for the sacrifices they made to stop that war. My little bit of rebellion in the military when I look at my friend Zells and Randy who went to prison and were much braver than I was because I enlisted. I was stupid. I was an idiot. I had to find out for myself. I had friends that called me an idiot when I told them I was enlisting, but I did, and I enlisted in the mil in the infantry. And after we were resupplied, we were sent out a bunch of SPs, and any grunt knows what SPs are: shave cream, candy, chuckles, coke shave cream, razors, all the good stuff. Budweiser beer, Pat's Blue Ribbon, all the good stuff. But anyway, we were told that a general was coming to pin medals on our chest for a job well done. You know what we did with that shave cream? In my squad, in my platoon, we took that shave cream and we sprayed every tree in the LZ with peace signs and fuck the army. <laughs> and when he came, he was greeted and he pinned soldiers. I was one that got some medals. He pinned medals on the most slovenly group of grunts that he'd ever seen. And to be honest with you, I breathed because I knew I had bad breath. I breathed in his face when he did it. Now, I know there's a lot of people here, and what Ken Burns and the, and the sister that made this thing, and I was liberal on it. To be honest, folks, I wanted the truth. I wanted, finally, something that said this is what happened. But guess what? It didn't do it. It didn't do it. There are some people that want to heal. That's what Ken Burns wants us to do. I'm an 11 Bravo. I'm a Vietnam veteran, proud of my freaking resistance, and I want to rip every scab off my arm and bleed all over the motherfucking war and all over the floor because I will never, my slogan, when I swore, I said never again, never forget when I, I'm sorry, I just, it's our job to tell the truth about this war and not let it lie. Seriously, it's up to us. 
Thank you, brothers. My name is Bert, and uh, I think there's a second lesson that the U.S. military learned from Vietnam. Yes, you don't let journalists get into places that aren't embedded with troops and aren't censored by the American military. And the same thing with the media back here. But the second lesson is American soldiers don't die. And the demonstration I think we need to remember about that is the use of air power increasingly in what we're doing these days. And I, well, I don't know if I can say I have PTSD from going to Iraq, but Iraq is the story of killing hundreds of thousands of completely innocent civilians because they were all under five years of age. They were all children. And they died because we bombed all the electrical plants and the infrastructure in Iraq. And then we imposed sanctions. That was the way we were going to get rid of Saddam Hussein and get our guy in power without having to send American troops in. Well, it didn't work in 2003. We sent American troops in. But people talk about the war in Iraq as if it began in 2003. It didn't. For the Iraqi people, it began in 1991. And those numbers of hundreds of thousands of children are not made up from Iraq. They come from New England Journal of Medicine, our doctors from Harvard and Oxford, and that's completely left out by American media. <clears throat> One more thing, maybe two. I'll do my best to keep it short. Um, I really think these are things that aren't known very well and need to be spoken about, be spoken about by people here who can speak to people, because it's the way we're doing war these days. Um, I wanted to say someone spoke about Tavis Smiley in his good book, The Death of a King. I ran to town hall and sat in the front row by a microphone, and I listened to Tavis Smiley talk about the death of Martin Luther King in that last year of his life. And I stood up and got the first question to him, and I thanked him for his good book and his talk, and I said, would you tell people here in the audience, because I'm convinced that the great majority don't even know there was a trial in the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1999 in Memphis, and the jury concluded after three and a half weeks of evidence that there was a conspiracy to kill Martin Luther King involving governmental agencies. That was the trial of the century. We have to recognize we're living in a country where that never makes it in the news. Last thing, I think the most important thing that I know I watched the first three episodes of Ken Burns' stories because I wanted to hear about what he would say, although I was pretty sure it would not be what I wanted him to say about John Kennedy. <clears throat> John F. Kennedy began his career as a Cold Warrior, but in the course of the brief few years that he had before he was killed, he clearly stood up to the military that wanted to have first strike nuclear attack against Cuba and against the Soviet Union. The Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest we've ever come to a nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And Kennedy stood up to the military and had correspondence with Khrushchev. There are wonderful books about this. My favorite one is JFK and the Unspeakable, where you can read about Kennedy's correspondence with Khrushchev, initiated by Khrushchev, 24 letters back and forth that helped build trust between Khrushchev and Kennedy so that when the Cuban Missile Crisis came, Kennedy would send his brother, Robert Kennedy, to talk to de Bruyne to tell Khrushchev, we need your help, Kennedy said. We need your help because I don't know if I can contain my military anymore. They want to overthrow me. And Khrushchev faced the same problem. Khrushchev and Kennedy both wanted to have an end to the Cold War. That was Kennedy's American University speech. All of this was going on. Khrushchev had more in common with Kennedy, and Kennedy with Khrushchev, than they did with their militaries. That's part of the history we need to know. And so as a consequence of Kennedy standing up and trying to end the Cold War, there was a political coup d'etat in this country 
and it was done by the assassination of John Kennedy, almost certainly by involving the CIA. Those are essential things we need to know. And if we don't correct that history that far back, it is a, how did Martin Luther King put it? A poison in our, in our history, in our genes. So, sorry? Soul. Yeah. Soul. Thank you, a poison in our soul, that's right. So we need to deal with all of those things because I couldn't agree more. The truth is the medicine we need that will make things better, and it's only the truth. Thank you. So the uh, day before Kennedy was, um, the day after Kennedy was assassinated, so I was married. I was a second lieutenant infantry, and uh, after that <clears throat> went and um, was assigned in Europe. So I did two tours in the Cold War. I did two tours in the Vietnam War, 1967 and 1971 and 72. So uh, there's an interesting gentleman in there. I think it was the, I watched up to the fourth uh, segment on Ken Burns, I think in this third segment there was something about Van, John Paul Van. Yeah, John Paul Van was, he <clears throat> ended up serving 10 years in Vietnam. He was committed to the Vietnamese effort and he was aligned really with civil operations more than the military. He resigned after the Aploc battle in the Mekong Delta and uh, he was disgusted with the way the war was being conducted. <clears throat> Later, he became senior advisor to two corps. Vietnam was divided by the military into four, four regions. So the second region, actually this uh, second tactical zone, and I reported to him, I was his adjutant general in 1971-72. He was subsequently killed uh, in a helicopter crash. So there are other sources about uh, that tell, that have some very good facts and data about the war besides Ken Burns. There's a compilation called Next Stop is Vietnam put out by Bear Family Records. Have any of you heard of that compilation? Uh, it contains uh, 300 songs written by uh, protesters like Pete Seeger, Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, and uh, contains 13 CDs. So uh, I have three songs. What came out of the Vietnam War for me was to write about the war, put it into music. I started writing songs <clears throat> and uh, doing publishing, promoting uh, back in 1959 when I was in high school. So 14 years ago, I put together a um, two CD set, wrote the music called Meet Me in Vietnam. And so three of my songs are on the Next Stop is Vietnam uh, compendium. Um, another source that was not mentioned, and maybe it was, but I don't think it was, because I spoke to his wife in Washington, D.C., and that's about Dr. Bernard Fall, was a historian on the Vietnam War on Indochina. So Dr. Fall was... Uh, uh, his parents were killed by the Nazis in Paris. They were uh, fighters in the underground, and he was 17 years old at that time. So I was a student of his before going to Vietnam the first time, because I was uh, assigned as an advisor um, both tours. So Dr. Fall gave us a presentation uh, when we went through the Army training for civil affairs. And uh, he said, a denial by the Pentagon is an affirmation. And uh, he had just returned from the Pentagon. He had given a great presentation. He gave the same thing, same set of slides to us. And it showed that the Viet Cong had control of 80% of the country in South Vietnam. So uh, Dr. Fall is one of the... Uh, one of the songs that I wrote, it's in my album, Meet Me in Vietnam, also Dorothy Fall, I spoke to his wife last week. She was very distressed that her husband was not mentioned in the Ken Burns series. Dr. Fall wrote some great books, Two Vietnams, Street Without Joy, 
hell in a very small place. So to me, if you don't want to, you know, you're not, not at the PhD level where you really know the, some of the nitty gritty, but if you read Dr. Fall's books, at least uh, two Vietnams and of course hell in a very small place, which was the defeat of the French by the, and Dean Van Phu, um, it's a great source. So what I'd like to offer the group is I brought these card download cards. So I currently have my album was written put together 14 years ago. It's called Meet Me in Vietnam, The Ultimate Collection. It's a two CD set. So I have free download cards. I thought I would pass them out if you want. Uh, they're yours. It's a gift from me. And uh, so there's more uh, to the story than a Ken Burns. Uh, my album is basically a protest album. Uh, I've, it, one of the songs is Ho Chi Minh. It's really a salute to Ho Chi Minh and that we didn't listen to what he said and that I kind of rake LBJ over the coals, McNamara, and many others. So put to music, rock and roll, it's got great rock and roll. Uh, you might enjoy it. Thank you. Could you, could you give your name again, please? My name's John Black. Thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Upbuck, the Battle of Upbuck. Yeah. That was actually covered uh, not, not fairly well in Burns, uh, at least the, yeah. the basics of it. But the, the gist of that battle was that here you had a, a small battalion, actually probably a couple of reinforced company of local force uh, NLF. They stood off a battalion plus of Arvin and American advisors. They shot down five helicopters and disabled uh, three or four armor personnel carriers. And the lesson learned from that van was actually an American advisor in that assault. He was lieutenant colonel. Yeah. He was flying it. A yeah. bird dog up above. And he, uh, um, the, it, the lesson that there was not learned from that was that these people are very competent, they're very tough, and they know what they're doing. Vaughn knew that, but that, was, that, that sort of knowledge was not passed on. So that was 65, 65. And, uh, you know, the war went on for another eight years. Using these people were, they had a, uh, uh, AK-47s and B-40s and a machine gun and some grenades. That's all they had. And booby traps, but about mines. But I mean, basically, they withdrew in good order, took their dead with them, and the Arvins, I mean, it was, it was a catastrophe that the United States Army did not learn anything from. Well, Van quit. He, he yeah. resigned. Yeah. Then, he, then he came back as a Foreign Service advisor. He had uh, equivalent status as uh, an ambassador. So one other, one other uh, thing that I sh should mention is, so I was a captain serving in the Mekong Delta. There were eight of us on this advisory team for civil operations. And uh, eight of us, we led a protest. We were all eight uh, regular army. We led a protest. We were working with the uh, Just Pal, uh, United States Public Affairs Office, and also USAID. And uh, it didn't go anywhere. We got uh, in pretty serious trouble. But it was a protest. Uh, against the war and the war and the way it was being conducted uh, particularly the con we saw the corrupt corruption firsthand and uh, we uh, made a big statement about it and uh, but uh, so those of us in the military there are those of us did in many cases stand up for the war the stories just haven't been told Uh, my name is Albert Penta, member, vet, member of Veterans for Peace. Um, just to, uh, one thing I, uh, about the film, I think he, d he, didn't, he didn't show the complexity of the fact that people, he, he had like, there was the student protesters and there was the, uh, they were the, people in the military who protested. I would just say, from my own case, uh, I was a member of the military. I was a student at University of Washington. I was a war protester. I applied as a conscientious objector. It was turned down. I was sent to, uh, given orders to go to Vietnam aboard ship. I refused and uh, was court-martialed. So all of those things were mixed for me. Uh, what I'd like to say, uh, I'd like to say two things. I'd like to say what I thought was the best part of the film 
and the worst part of the film, or two things that stood out, one of the best parts and one of the worst parts. One of the best parts, I thought, was when they had those tape recorders rolling and they had, uh, they had the, uh, the, wor the words, the, the, the actual words of uh, LBJ and McNamara and of Nixon and Kissinger. And that, th that was, the, I mean, that was the truth of the film right there. I mean, the policy members, well, I guess I can't say they were lying bastards. I'm not supposed to say that. So let's say they were warmongers, warmongers, and they were war criminals. And there was no accountability for what, uh, what they did and the other policy members. Uh, after World War II, uh, in Nuremberg, when they had the trials, the war crimes trials, there was an accountability not only for German people that changed German society, but also for the world, held up for the world. These were, these people were war criminals. They got some accountability. There was some degree of justice and some degree, they were held up as an example of something that should never be done again. That was not done uh, after Vietnam, and we've suffered as a people because of that, uh, in that uh, we went on to make the same mistakes, the lessons not learned. Uh, we, you know, or Iraq, as Bert said, starting from 1991 right on through, and 16 years of Afghanistan, and, and who knows what's coming ahead. And because of the myths, it's all allowed to carry on. The part I thought was one of the worst parts of the film was when uh, Dr. Uh, Hal Kushner, who was an interesting character, he was a prisoner of war for an exceptionally long time, and he was like, so he, he did not experience the things that the rest of us, either whether you were in Vietnam or you were in front of your TV set, to see the changes constantly happening. Uh, when he was, the film footage when he was finally released and uh, had his, uh, he went back to his unit and was greeted and he gave his little talk. To pair that, to pair that film footage with the song of Ray Charles singing America the Beautiful, I thought that was, uh, <laughs> way over the top. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Thanks, Al. Hi. Uh, my name is Steve Lee. I'm a member of the International Socialist Organization. I just wanted to say thanks very much to, uh, to the organization for putting this on. This is great. Um, and I also wanted to say that I think one really underestimated aspect of the anti-war movement is the role of the soldiers in Vietnam and, and people in the Air Force and everything and so forth in Vietnam. That I think is, I think if anything, it's the most crucial aspect of it. I mean, the the domestic anti-war movement was very very important and it helped to lay the basis for what happened in Vietnam as far as the soldiers organizing. But part of the reason the U.S. pulled out is because the the army was disintegrating in Vietnam because of the anti-war activity and that was very very crucial so I think that we we owe a deep deep debt of gratitude to everybody in Vietnam who was organizing against the war during that time and I and, and you folks are carrying on that tradition I think that's fantastic um, but I also wanted to say that because of that because of because we got the U.S. out um, the Vietnam syndrome, as they call it, has not yet died, and that is before going into Vietnam. Uh, I remember, you know, we were people generally thought if the U.S. government told us something, they were probably telling us the truth, you know. And after Vietnam, it's like if the U.S. government is telling us something, well, maybe they're probably not telling us the truth, right? There's a deep, deep cynicism, especially about U.S. foreign policy which I think is really, really good and hasn't been harnessed into a new movement yet in, a, in the way that it was in Vietnam. But that, that cynicism and that opposition, I think, is there to be harnessed, especially if it's connected to uh, domestic issues and as the economic crisis grows and ecological crisis grows and so forth. I think all these things are connected and can 
really lay the basis for a much stronger anti-war movement as we go forward. Thank you. Go ahead, Cliff. Yeah, my name is Cliff Wells. I'm a, a, a active, inactive. Uh, I've been with the Veterans for Peace for a number of years. And uh, I've learned a lot about this country's foreign policy. And I'm concerned today, as we should have been concerned most of our lives. It seems like every time we've gone into war, it's been under false pretenses. We've rushed into it too fast and too, too late recognized what was wrong. It's my understanding the, um, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution was repealed. Um, I don't know if it was officially repealed, if it was done away with or other details, but um, I remember talking to a, a coworker about it and someone else in the room said, why are you guys talking about Vietnam? This guy had been in Vietnam two tours. And he said, because it's another war we should have never been in, just like Iraq. Um, I, I, I smell every time we talk about Iran, every time we talk about Iraq, every time we talk about another country in this world, our intention is to kill them or to get or to have our way with them. Um, I think every time I heard about kidnappings in South America when I was a kid, and like I say, any, any other country, our intention is to have our way with them. It's bullying, it's military, it's corporate hitman, I can't remember, the economic hitman. It's shocking. As a uh, U.S. of amnesian um, who always forgets, um, it, it's frustrating to me. There's times I think I need to carry around a scorecard to remember all of the, the things. We've dropped more bombs on Vietnam than we dropped on World War II. I believe we also dropped more bombs on Cambodia than we did on World War II. What did they ever do to us? The stuff we're doing in Korea right now is just like the Gulf of Tonkin in August 4th, 1964. I remember it because it's two days after my sister's birthday. I understand from Daniel Ellsberg that there were two destroyers doing provocative moves on North Vietnam in those days. We weren't in an actual war, but God knows what we were in. Maybe it's more important to me than other people. But it, also, the U.S. Naval Institute has a story up that says that elements of South Vietnamese commandos working with U.S. Navy SEALs were making attacks on watchouts and radar stations in North Vietnam. So when we said we were being attacked uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin, the Turner Joy, which is now in Bremerton, and the Maddox, I don't know where, when we said we were being attacked, maybe it was because we planned on being attacked in, in response to what we were doing. The U.S. Navy says the attacks never happened. Daniel Ellsberg, an expert on Vietnam, his first day in the Pentagon was August 4th, says that they don't have that many torpedoes. It's not possible. And in spite of the fact that, that uh, Lyndon Johnson said th things that day, it seemed like every sentence he had, he said, had one or two lies in it. We're doing that today. When we launched that, that flight of B-1 bombers and F-15 and F-16 fighters over Korea the other day, um, it shocked me, it scared the hell out of me because the, the North Koreans have to be careful about what we do there. It's so easy to launch stealth attacks. That's why we have stealth fighters, stealth bombers, stealth weapons. And our F-20 and F-35s are not designed to defend us. They are to attack North Korea or China or someone who has a radar system. We are not the good guys. We have to learn that and we have to learn to every moment watch our government and never trust in a hurry what they're doing because their intentions are not good. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. Hi, my name is Jim Page. I'm going to hold this up here. Uh, I, I want to make two two observations. I've only seen, I, I bogged down on the third one, too. The third one really bothered me for some reason. I got through the fourth, and I'm kind of beginning on the fifth. They're hard to watch. I want to make a couple of, of observations. First of all, the timing of this thing is a little bit suspicious to me. And I think, OK, I'm 68 years old. I graduated from high school in 1967. It was uh, the war. That was all we thought about. I mean, I had dead friends on a tombstone in my high school. It was a gift before I even got out of the, before I even graduated. So that was, that was the world. That was life. But the reason the war ended the way it did was because the Vietnamese were such 
because it was their country and they were not going to lay down, and because of what the active duty soldiers were doing, the anti-war active duty soldiers were doing. And it's very, very important that the anti-war movement in this country be overlooked, be denigrated, get insulted, be called childish, and be basically forgotten. Okay, that's more important than the war being elevated. Okay, but it can be done if the people who prosecuted the war, fought in the war, organized the war, the presidents, the senators, all of them, the colonels and generals, are seen as well-meaning, bumbling fools, then the peace movement, the anti-war movement, can be seen as over the top, uh, shrill, childish, a little bit gone too far. We can talk about Jane Fonda, <laughs> Hanoi Jane, we can do all that kind of stuff. And the, pe and the peace movement won't happen. We've just entered the era of Trump, and it's very important that we don't have a national popular anti-war movement is very important. The other thing I want to I want to bring up, go back to like 2005, I think it was. I'm sitting, I'm watching TV. You know, they'll, they'll like embed the journalists now with the troops. That's something they learned from Vietnam. They don't show you bodies, and they don't let people go around and do whatever they want. So they're embedded with the troops. And this guy, I think it was PBS, Public Broadcasting, the same creatures that bring us this one. Um, they're going through Baghdad or something, and uh, the reporter is there in the Humvee, and all of a sudden the sergeant says, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically this is what he said, but I'm not paraphrasing the whole thing. The last comment is an actual complete quote. He says, okay, everybody, pay attention. Here, and now here's the quote. This is Indian country. That's what he said. This is Indian country. Now, I was by myself, but I sat up and I looked around the room to see who else heard that. But nobody else heard it because I was by myself. This is Indian country. That tells you something. That's what they said. Am I right or am I wrong? That's how they referred to enemy territory in Vietnam. Is that right? Am I right or wrong? Yes. Yeah, this is Indian country. This country that we live in was built on Indian country. It got to where it is by Indian wars. They moved west by Indian wars. They went to Vietnam with an Indian war. They went to Iraq with an Indian war. They're in Afghanistan with an Indian war. And if we don't start looking at what we are actually doing, and we don't realize what the important thing is, the anti-war movement rather than the war itself, then they've got it. They've got it. And we help them get it. That's it. Thank you, Jim. Hi, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm uh, Hương Nguyễn, and you can tell I'm, Viet I'm a Vietnamese. Um, so um, thank you all for being here, and then also uh, I have to thank the film and the filmmakers uh, that you know creating this opportunity for all of us to be here today and talk about Vietnam again. Um, well, I agree with a lot of things that you have commented. Um, and um, with all of the um, comments that Christoph made uh, the earlier, um, at the beginning, um, about the failure of the film, but um, you know, there's no single truth about like anything as complicated as the Vietnam War. And uh, as someone uh, working on um, the social history of the Vietnam War, um, I have a very quick comment on like one of the big failures of the film that um, I found, uh, you know, it's still a, you know, a big gap in also in the war historiography and um, in the film like this, you know, made by Americans. Um, we really don't know much about uh, Vietnam and the Vietnamese people living on the ground and uh, what they experienced during the war. Um, we ha listened to a lot of interviews and, um, you know, the interviews with American soldiers, a lot of people, uh, um, a lot of Americans. We also heard some stories about Vietnamese people and Vietnamese life, but I'm sure there's a lot, a lot more uh, in Vietnam and about the Vietnamese community and also, as you know, as a regional war. Uh, there's also a lot more stories about Cambodian and Laos, you know, Laotian. And um, so 18 hours uh, for one documental film is never enough for this kind of war. And uh, we still, 
you know, we don't, we shouldn't have, I guess, um, you know, high expectation for this kind of documentary on um, the war that happened in, you know, in Vietnam and in other countries. So I guess we still have to wait for another war in the future. I mean, another film in the future, <laughs> you know, um, another film in the future uh, that really, um, Won't be a new tech, a new perspective on, uh, you know, the community, the war generation, and what really happened in the war era. Thanks. Uh, thank you uh, for your comments. Um, I think that that goes back to what I said in the beginning. You know, I don't. Uh, I think it, uh, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick made it very clear that it was an exploration into the American experience and what, quote unquote, Vietnam, uh, the war, not the country, but what Vietnam did to American soul or so. That is, that is his, his uh, spiel uh, uh, throughout his whole, whole work. Uh, and you're, you're completely right, right. I mean, the war, the, the brunt of the war was Uh, was taken by common Vietnamese, particularly in the southern Vietnamese countryside, and that is really not in that film. And it it belongs in in a in a, in a serious um, a representation of of the Vietnam War. My my complaint, so to say, is that this series was propagated um, uh, very heavily on this kind of shoulder padding that. Well, we included now a lot of diverse Vietnamese voices, right? And I think here you have a very good example of kind of liberal white privilege, right? To be self-congratulatory about including Vietnamese voices, but really only including them in, in an unchanged American narrative. But if you want to hear Vietnamese voices, you have to take their narrative and their views and their experiences seriously. Thank you. Yeah, I was uh, I was going to say uh, that that is one of the great omissions of that uh, film is that the everyday citizen, uh, Vietnamese uh, uh, citizen in in uh, Vietnam, was not really not heard from. We heard from uh, veterans, uh, uh, Vietnam veterans uh, from both sides, but we didn't really hear much from the civilians, and they took the brunt of the war. Um, he could have interviewed uh, Nick Terse, who wrote uh, Kill Anything That Moves, about the um, massacres and the way that we prosecuted that war. And he went over to Vietnam, and he, and he, he did talk to the people who uh, lived, in the, lived in bunkers and underground and really suffered from uh, the way we uh, prosecuted that war. So uh, that's, that, that's a kind of a real omission that, uh, uh, from that film. I think this is an incredible event. And I think everything you're, everything you're saying about the representation of reality as it's baptized into existence through people like Ken Burns is itself a very useful form of political propaganda. And it really is one that reinforces all kinds of mythologies about the United States, uh, belief in, you know, uh, that the government represents everyone. Um, but having watched the entire series and being a filmmaker, I, of course, need to really call out Beth Sanders and her wonderful work that she did to counter this narrative. Her film on the Vietnam War and the draft was is really something not to be forgotten. But the thing that stood out for me is how is it that in this country there can be so much effort and energy put into the death of approximately 58,000 American soldiers when over two million, two million, over two million Vietnamese were killed directly because of the activities of the United States government? I mean, to me, that utter metric is astonishing and horrifying. And of course, it's always, you know, every 
bit of coverage of a war is always done from a perspective. But I'm thinking about how can we move this forward? How can we, if we're going to take, if we're going to be reproducing an, a new narrative about the Vietnam War, I think it needs to come from that perspective that, you know, what is the metric when it comes to human life? And how are we going to move this forward from now? You know, I'm a teacher. I, I teach at Antioch University. I teach students, many of whom are veterans, who are um, survivors of more recent wars. But I'm thinking, how do we move this forward so we can start thinking about maybe somewhere having a realistic vision of what could life be like in a world without war? Um, years ago, I did a film on a um, composer, um, Earl Robinson, in, in that period of the 1930s and 40s. Um, you know, he was writing songs and he was part of a community that said, in one of the lyrics was, um, suppose they gave a war and no one came. <laughs> and of course, Howard Zinn is a historian who advocated for this idea that war does not have to be an inevitability. And while that may seem maybe Pollyannish or a little too utopian, I think that if we start thinking about the next phase as maybe it would be possible to have a world without war. And maybe it would be possible to educate others that human life shouldn't, we shouldn't be bedazzled by just the American view of the tragedy of Americans dying. The metric is outrageous. Um, so that's all I have to say. I wanted to um, comment on the thing. Um, well, first of all, I just want to point out that there's a really good film called Sir No Sir, which is about uh, GI resistance to the war. And in some senses, it was our finest hour, in my opinion. Um, I'm somewhat biased, I suppose. But, um, but uh, it was sort of a moment when something sort of rare in history happened, which was people choosing humanity over uniform. And that, in any nation, is kind of awesome and, 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 and really rare and to be cherished. And one of the great things about the Vietnam situation you know, was how many people did choose humanity over uniform um, or humanity over nationality or whatever, however you want to put it. Um, and uh, if you haven't seen that, that film, Sir No Sir, I encourage you to try and seek it out. But what I really wanted to talk about um, right this second is a critique of the Ken Burns series just from a film point of view because the power of film, uh, you know, you can have position papers and books and it's the best way to do, to do, you know, theoretical stuff, I suppose, is, you know, in papers, you know, in books and that sort of thing. But the power of the motion picture, you know, is is the ability of the filmmaker to grab an audience emotionally, you know. And uh, you know, film school—that's what they teach—is how to catch an audience and hold them emotionally. And if you look at the series, you know, um, there's you know there's some stuff in there that would satisfy a historian maybe you know and obviously not but uh, <laughs> but where you could say well they covered this and they did cover that and i kind of had my little checklist like probably everybody did you know and say like, well you know how are they going to handle the the gulf of tonkin incident or what, which i didn't like how they did it but 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 the real sneaky part of the of the of that series was where the emotions were so there was sort of like, you know, the checklist. I think they were more or less obligated to admit what people already knew, you know, about um, you know certain elements. They had to say that there had been a My Lai massacre, for instance, or whatever. But the real emotion, if you look at that series, the ten-part series, the real emotional parts were the were the parts that had something to do with. Uh, the heroics of the American military, you know, uh, you know, they, they slogging into hell, you know, and charging the enemy and whatever, and you know, um, um, and that sort of stuff, or the kind of right wing 
stuff. Like the, I'll just give you an example. Uh, there's the, there's the so a mother who had lost her son in Vietnam, and and somebody in the movement went to her and asked her to whether whether she would like to speak at the at a demonstration, and she and she, you know. Um, kind of did that whole thing where she says well you know um, you know you have your right to have your demonstration but if you ever come on my porch again I'm gonna shoot you with a 357 or whatever and it was like a real emotional moment you know but a real backwards moment you know and and the that whole thing you know it starts with some history but by the time you get to episode number 10 it's it's um, Protesters apologizing for their protest, and and um, and the people at the memorial wall, you know, weeping for our lost heroes, and and you know, it was it was just a dreadful, in my opinion, it just really pissed me off, you know, because because the emotion thing, the the where the real stuff, you know, even stuff where they would admit something, and then they would like they had John Kerry's speech, great speech. You know, you know, absolutely wonderful speech where he kind of said, "This is our finest hour. Maybe this is the time when we're going to actually change how we do this stuff." And and it's going to be because of, you know, the um, the um, um, the people who were willing to stand up and all that stuff. And then they immediately go to something that undercuts that. You know, that sort of wonderful moment is undercut immediately in a way that you know that reactionary woman when she's threatening to shoot protesters. You know, nothing to undercut that, you know, and, and so the end result is that we could be satisfied, uh, you know, perhaps that our checklist was, you know, you know, we got enough things on our checklist and you can say, okay, the series wasn't that bad. But I bet you anything that the Trump supporters who watched that series came away with a very different experience because they would be emotionally grabbed by all of those kind of stories of the heroism and, and stuff. So in some, you could probably say that that uh, you could sum up the whole series by saying, well, there were some quibbles about how the war started and how we conducted it, but boy, weren't our, weren't our boys just great? And that's kind of a, such a horrible undercutting of the actual lessons that we, we have, where you could say uh, it was our finest hour, where we actually stood up against our own government and, and chose humanity over uniform. Thanks, Randy. Good evening, and thank you. I'd like some discussion from the panel. I noticed before this series was introduced, at the bottom of the web pages were their prime sponsors, the usual Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the, the um, various acronyms of the um, National Petroleum Broadcasting, whatever those three are. Then there was, of course, Bank of America. A third family sponsor whose name I don't recall. One of you might Blatansky or something. And then it's either Charles or David Coke. Could you describe, d dis elaborate on the relationship between the sponsors and the program that we saw? I'm very intrigued that this was so well done from the perspective of the corporate sponsors. Thank you. Or as well, that's, that's part of this truth that uh, we're all seeking and that we should be you know, focused on the veteran uh, and their courage, um, their resilience, um, and how we can reconcile. And so the, that, that's a sp pretty small uh, bar to uh, overcome um, when you're, when you're, you know, when you've got corporate sponsors like they do. So. You know, I just think it's uh, one of the, um, you know, on the one hand, he needed the money to make such a <laughs> huge, complex uh, movie, but uh, it, it certainly limited him. Uh, 
just let me let me uh, let me follow us. I'll go get you next. Uh, I, one of the other uh, commentators earlier talked about metrics and the single truth. One of the, the I think the single truth of the of, of this war is that there were almost three million Vietnamese killed. Most of these were civilians. That is the truth. That's a fact. The other fact is that we mentioned uh, uh, so-called Indochina or Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Uh, and it was talking about the bombing. We bombed and left what they call UXOs there. Every province in Vietnam is contaminated with what they call UXOs, unexploded ordnance. Dan works for uh, the only American NGO that's actually involved in active demining in Vietnam. Uh, there are other organizations, but I mean, that's the other truth of the Indochina War is that the legacy of that war is not only the ke toxic chemicals in the in the water and the soil, but the bombs. And the Vietnamese estimate that for Vietnam, it'll take them a hundred years to clean that mess up. Thank you. Just a quick point to follow up on what Dan was talking about uh, about Ken Burns. Uh, these are the same kinds of sponsors that he's had for all his previous series, and he's going to do many more series in the future. So he's worried about his brand, just like Donald Trump. Hi there, I'm Dale Rector. I uh, served with the 9th Infantry Division from June 67 to uh, Tet Offensive when I was wounded. Uh, I just want to re reinforce this business of metrics, kill ratio, and that's something that comes right with us, and I've been thinking about it ever since I came back. Thank God, I, it was a very, very short period of time. I was in Vietnam before I saw the whole thing for what it was, and I did chicken out on going into the stockade right then, there, because I heard some things about what happened to people that did that. So I chose not to, but I knew the minute I hit the ground, and it was true when I hit Travis Air Force Base in California, from that time until right now, I've been a very active anti-war activist. And, uh, and this, this film, for all of the weaknesses that you've pointed out, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. But this is the point. This is the point. There was, what is it, 16 hours, something like that, of stuff brought up now that we all need to be talking about, that we, any of us that participated in it, anybody that is looking at it and wondering about it and asking other people and finding things out and then go out and spread more, all of you here who weren't there but are, are now knowing a little bit more about it, we've just got to do more. But the metric thing, the ratio thing, I was on point for the first six months. I didn't even worry about getting killed. I was sure something was going to happen. So that was the happy part. Then when I thought I might get to go home, I started worrying and then I eventually got wounded. But I was almost always in a, in a position to know what contact was, what contact with the enemy was. It's actually said, I think it's in three or four. I've only seen the first seven so far. But someplace in there, one of the guys says that he kind of realized all of a sudden that, oh, we're just, we're just going out there to get ambushed. And once we're ambushed, they know where the enemy is. And they can start bringing in the napalm, and they can start bringing in the artillery, and they can, and I saw that from the beginning on. It was unbelievable. And, and I started thinking about how many Vietnamese were dying. I got back, the thing ended. It was 50,000 Americans. It was 2 million, 3 million Vietnamese. But the kill ratios have gotten worse and worse. When we went into the Persian Gulf, I just watched and listened. Hardly any Americans, nothing happened. And thousands and thousands and thousands of Iraqis died, not to mention the, all the people that died in Iraq from the sanctions. Now what I want to do is take, just jump us forward to right now and our, and our commander in chief, uh, who is saying, just wait, I'm not going to tell you, but just wait. He, this is a, a good possibility of using millions of people in South Korea to pursue this thing when he knows probably these guys can't, maybe they can, and that, that's possible too, but that they, that they, they aren't going to be able to do anything before they go. He goes ahead and jumps in there and sacrifices that many people, and it's all about technology. It's all about this, this idea of, oh, we're not, we're not going to be killed. You know, these other people are going to be killed, these other people in these other countries. So, and, and the final reminder is simply that, once again, Bangor Base is sitting right over there with the greatest concentration of nuclear weapons anywhere on the planet. And it's just a few miles away from Seattle. And people keep forgetting it, keep forgetting it. So we've got to just work on this hard and spread the word. And this is a good thing to talk about. A lot of people are watching this. Thank you for your comments.
Well, we're just about out of time. We are, we've got the room until uh, 9. Is that right, Chris? Uh, this has actually been a very good, good thing. I want to thank you all for your thoughtful comments and questions. Uh, we're filming this, of course. Uh, I think we have an audio, too. We'll see how that comes. But uh, we're going to edit this and, and make it more widely available. You can check back with the VF, uh, VFP92 website. This will take a while to do, but we're going to try and distribute this as much of this, uh, this uh, discussion as we can. As far as I know, this has not been done any place in the United States. Uh, uh, we're going to try and make it as, uh, you know, it's a discussion that needs to be happening. And <clears throat> our, our last commentator is right about this for all of its faults. This film did sort of open up the wounds here and provoke the discussion, and I think that that's a good thing. Thank you.